Welcome to Taiwan Talks. My name is Annie. Leading up to the anticipated Biden-Xi meeting at the APAC Forum, U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned against economic decoupling and sought to reassure Asian countries that a U.S. approach to China would not lead to a disastrous division of the global economy that would ultimately force them to take sides. Now, what does that mean for her statement about a U.S. economic policy in the Indo-Pacific area, mean with the Biden-Xi meeting on the horizon? Joining us today are Christy Tsun Tzu Xu, Chenghua Institution of Economic Research, Taiwan Asian Study Center Director, and Vincent Chow, Taipei City Councilor. Warm welcome to the show. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Xu, um, Yellen also stated just a few days ago saying that U.S. does seek China collaboration, however, with an eye still on national security. So in your take, how is this going to work? Um, I think Yellen's remarks are pretty much consistent with um, Biden administration's uh, comments, particularly the uh, comments made by uh, the State Secretary uh, Blinken earlier. And they are a part of um, the uh, G7 communique right. when uh, the G7 leaders met uh, this year in uh, Hiroshima, Japan. And um, the Japan and also the EU and also the US have reached a agreement in that statement that they are not looking to entirely decouple from China. However, they will work more on um, uh, de-risking as mm -hmm. well as uh, diversifying and trying to um, uh, uh, um, lessen dependence on Chinese and China in terms of supply chain as well as other issues. I think that is the reason that the Biden right now have a new strategic uh, approach that is not um, decoupling as he has always been mentioned and also it will be uh, de-risking. And for that, I think there are several reasons for Biden to choose to this um, approach. The first is, and after six years of, um, for example, the 301 tariff imposed, the U.S. has already found it's extremely too expensive for U.S. to entirely decouple from Chinese economy. Right. And secondly, that um, the U.S. has to um, so-called synchronize its stance with the EU and other G7, uh, G7 leaders as well as um, Quad leaders. I think uh, for EU's concern, they are looking for decoupling, uh, not looking for decoupling, and they try to collaborate still with Chinese economy. Mm -hmm. And I think the recent example of Australia trying to rebalance its relationship with China sets a perfect example of how these Quad partners are looking for uh, rebalancing their relationship with China. Right. And thirdly, I think it is also most important is that um, um, they have to, the U.S. has to respond to um, um, what they call the like-minded partners, especially those in Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. They are pop, uh, they are uh, vital players in Biden's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm -hmm. And in the past year, uh, Southeast Asian countries have from time to time expressed their uh, growing concerns over, for example, uh, Trump's uh, hard stance on China. Mm -hmm. and they they are reluctant to uh, be asked or to be forced to choose side. And therefore, Biden has to reassure these um, uh, uh, partners that they are not looking for uh, the de uh, decoupling. And in the meantime, they are trying to work Southeast Asian countries to enhance their economic resilience. I think these are all the reasons. And um, by doing this, I mm -hmm. think um, Biden can even better collaborate with Southeast Asian countries. Right. Thank you, Shu. So Vincent Shu actually listed a lot of reasons for why it's important that we move from decoupling to de-risking. So mm -hmm. from your point of view, do you think this is going to work in the long run? That's a good question, actually, because uh, how much of de-risking is correlated and connected to decoupling and vice versa? I think that's a I think, difficult question for any of us to answer. But I will say that um, I completely agree with what Christy said. I think um, currently the U.S. is faced with a number of economic and political realities. And on the economic front, the foremost reality is that this simply isn't achievable. You can't decouple hundreds of billions of dollars in trade. Exactly. And it's not mm -hmm. particularly necessary to do so either because 80-90% yeah. of this trade has nothing to do with, mm -hmm. for example, national security. has nothing to do with the central components, nothing to do with, for example, t tech sanctions and so forth. I mean, so that's first of all the economic reality. The political reality is also this. The U.S. is heading into election season, there is very big and recurrent concern over inflation. And mm -hmm. if, for example, um, um, the, the importation of Chinese goods, the prices of which continue to go up because of sanctions, uh, because of decoupling, because of tariffs, then that's going to hurt the U.S. administration politically as well. So I do think the U.S. has taken a smarter and very targeted approach 
towards engaging with China. And that's going to be the focus on maybe the 5 to 10 percent of trade that does have national security implications is connected to high-tech sanctions and is correlated with what people see as the U.S., um, I think, ambitions to bring back some of their more sensitive manufacturing industries back to the states. Mm -hmm. And I think you also raised a very important point that election is coming up. So d obviously the U.S. has its own agenda. But before we move on to that, let's still move back to Yellen for a little bit here. Because she did emphasize that the Biden administration does not wish to harm the Chinese economy like we talked about earlier. But at the same time, they will not be asking other nearby countries to take side as well. So while Yellen is saying that, Vincent, who do you think the target audience is for Yellen when she said that? I think they're talking basically to across Southeast Asia in particular, but the global south as a whole. And the reason is simple, because particularly in Southeast Asia, it's a region we're more familiar with. What we've seen in the past decades is that these countries have made a choice. Economically, they're going to choose China because China's close. It's in many cases their largest trading partner. Mm -hmm. It's important for their economies. It's important for investment. I mean, look at the high-speed rail line uh, now connecting Jakarta. Right. Um, but in terms of security, in terms of strategic relationships, they chose the United, United States. I mean, um, many Southeast Asian countries are treaty allies with the United States. Some host U.S. Uh, bases, U.S. troops. And so that fine balance is always going to be struck in Southeast Asia because ultimately I think this balance is what they've determined serves their own best national interest. So I think the U.S. is also being quite sophisticated here because if push came to shove, I'm not sure the U.S. would find many takers for, from Southeast Asia countries saying that I'm willing to forego all of these economic interests in a sole pursuit of my strategic and security interests. Right. And so by saying essentially having Yellen say that, you know, we're not forcing you to pick sides. Mm -hmm. It's essentially giving these countries space and room for them to continue what they've doing, which is focus on building an economic relationship with China, but at the same time develop a robust security partnership with the United States. And Shu, do you agree with that? Sure. Um, I think it's very clear that now uh, Southeast Asian countries, including Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, and Vietnam, they uh, separate their stance uh, uh, to support uh, the U.S. For example, on um, security collaboration and also um, deterrence uh, on Chinese military uh, aggression in Indo-Pacific, they are very much supportive of uh, uh, Biden. And you can tell that by increasing number of joint military military exercise in uh, South China Sea, as an example. However, when it comes to economic engagement, as well as for trade and other political issues, I think um, Southeast Asia will still want to have their own uh, policy space. Particularly, they are now all working so hard to um, try to recover their economy post the pandemic. And therefore, working with China becomes even more important than any other time before the pandemic. Right, and let's take Vietnam as an example here. We're, we're actually saying that Vietnam um, also is a little bit shifting to the US, which has been a little bit rare for the yes. coming um, years. And Vietnam is also playing a very increasingly role of French shoring. So first question for you, Xu, is could you please elaborate a little bit more about the French shoring and second, how important is French shoring of Vietnam to the U.S.? Yes, um, French shoring has become a, a, a very important term for all researchers and policymakers in the past few years. Yeah. But before I come to uh, French shoring, I would like to um, give a little bit background of um, Biden's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy. Mm -hmm. When uh, he released the strategy, it was about two years after the whole world suffered from a uh, crisis or a supply chain disruption because of the pandemic pandemic, for example, the shortage of uh, facial masks mm -hmm. in early 2020 and also the shortage of semiconductors for automobile uh, later in 2021 and 2022. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that factor has become a very important background for Biden to uh, uh, further uh, further uh, uh, pursue its Indo-Pacific strategy. And therefore, on the one hand, he uh, last year, he uh, negotiate and also initiate the IPATH, for example, to try to work with other economies to uh, enhance uh, supply chain resilience. And on the other hand, he proposed the so-called French Shore Initiative, especially targeting uh, uh, targeting Vietnam, Mexico, India, and some other uh, developing countries. And what makes uh, French Shore so different from uh, the uh, 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 
uh, reshoring or nearshoring. Uh, uh, reshoring meaning that uh, the U.S. trying to bring back the supply chain to its neighbor, for example, Mexico and also some Latin American country. So when the U.S. is in need of critical materials and product, he can easily access um, a, a products uh, produced by its neighbor. And reshoring meaning that for the past years, the U.S., tr uh, Trump and Biden have tried so hard to bring back the supply mm -hmm. chain back to the U.S. Right. And uh, TSMC is part of that example. And however, uh, the U.S. understand that if uh, both uh, reshoring and neoshoring cannot work, it cannot be proved to be commercially viable, and they will have to work with other countries, uh, friends or like-minded partners to bring back or to uh, help this country to attract supply chain. I think Vietnam is part of the uh, a, a very important French sharing strategy. However, I will have to say that uh, though in the past uh, months, we've seen um, significant progress of this French sharing, for example, uh, Apple company mm -hmm. already expanded or relocated part of its iPhone supply chain to uh, Vietnam, Vietnam and also right. to India. Mm -hmm. And also the U.S. is encouraging semiconductor company to invest in Vietnam, in India, as well as in Mexico. However, uh, to build supply chain to replace the China supply chain will take years right. uh, or even a decade. And therefore the U.S. has to uh, work harder by providing more incentive and also other uh, a, a concrete methods to work with these uh, friends to make sure that the supply chain will not be a temporary uh, movement. And how do you think that's going to work in the long run? You're saying incentives from the U.S. How is that going to work? Well, I think uh, from 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 the current uh, progress, there are a lot of new suppliers going to Vietnam, also Mexico. However, they are now focusing in the very uh, uh, downstream. Uh, part, for example, they are assembled goods, mm -hmm. but they still need to import, for example, from China, the intermediate goods and components and everything. So that is not what we call the supply chain resilience. So I think the uh, U.S. will have to work better or more with Vietnam to solve, for example, the infrastructure issues and mm -hmm. also to help cultivate and prepare uh, adequate, uh, adequate workforce and talent so that um, the real emergence of this kind of supply chain can be sustainable. So economically speaking, we're saying that you know Vietnam is very significant and important to the U.S. in terms of French shoring in the short run and also U.S. probably have to work harder in the long run. So that's we're talking about economically. Now politically, Vincent, I would like to ask you, Biden also paid visit to Vietnam um, recently, which went over the headlines of a lot of newspapers and media. It has been a little bit rare. So what is the action behind this implying that Vietnam is drawing closer, closer to the U.S.? Yeah, that was a very special visit, actually, because Biden sort of skipped out on ASEAN, mm -hmm. and that left a lot of people, I think, quite unhappy across the region. But it put the spotlight on U.S. and Vietnam relations. And after Biden's visit um, to Vietnam, they upgraded their relationship. So you have various levels, according to Vietnam. You have this partnership, then you have comprehensive partnership, then you have a comprehensive strategic partnership, <laughs> their highest level. Mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, I think they're going to um, discuss with Japan as well in coming days. Uh, but in particularly in terms of the U.S.-Vietnam visit, so they upgraded their relationship. And I think it's really like this. So I think Biden and the U.S. in general have a couple of interests in Vietnam. First one, they want to seek a counterweight to curb China's ambitions in the South China Sea. I think that's very, very important. Uh, because of what China is doing in terms of military rise in the region and potentially heightening the risks of conflict there. Second, I think th it's very important that they want to draw Vietnam into this larger Indo-Pacific strategy mm -hmm. um, because Vietnam, because of its geographical position, because of its past history, because, I mean, it is a big country um, geographically in terms of strategically. Um, it's an ideal partner formed in the Pacific region. And then the third reason, I think, is what we talked about earlier with Christie, which is the economic reason, which is as you reduce your trade dependencies on the PRC, particularly in sensitive um, technologies and manufacturing, I mean, a lot of this just isn't going to go back to the state because of cost and other reasons, but they might go to other neighboring countries that the United States has better relationship with, like Vietnam. So I think that was very much a scenario where the U.S. decided and made a conscious effort to say that they're going to do something with Vietnam mm -hmm. to draw the spotlight there and try to build up this relationship in each of these facets. So in terms of the South China Sea, I think the U.S. would want to see Vietnam do a little bit more um, in terms of being able um, to not only justify this area as, 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 as not part of the PRC, mm -hmm. uh, but also to bring uh, in other ASEAN partners to sort of counterweight what China is doing there. 
The second issue, in terms of basically the Indo-Pacific strategy, I think the U.S. with an eye towards the cross-strait situation, East China Sea, South China Sea, wants Vietnam to play a more strategic role in sort of balancing um, not only the U.S. relationship with China, but the region's uh, relationship with China as well. And we talked about the economic component. So I do see this as one area we're probably going to see a lot of progress in the years to come between the U.S. and Vietnam. But we're seeing this more as the U.S. agenda. What about for China? Now they're saying that Vietnam is also drawing closer to the U.S. And this all comes from the threat of the South China Sea. How do you think China is going to react to that? Well, I mean, we have to understand that this, that this has been a long time coming. I mean, mm -hmm. Vietnam and China fought a war. <laughs> I mean, so did, did they with the United States. But in particular, I think the public in Vietnam has been quite anti-China mm -hmm. uh, in recent years, um, either due to labor issues or, or so forth. But I, I do think that China, to a certain extent, probably does see what the U.S. is doing. I mean, they're also trying to increase um, mm -hmm. their economic heft in Vietnam. But I think ultimately uh, Vietnam is going to do what is in their own political and economic interests, right. which at this point point towards a stronger relationship uh, towards the U.S. Uh, and particularly taking into account public sentiments towards China and Vietnam in general. Mm -hmm. And Xu, back to you a little bit here. Um, aside from Vietnam, we're seeing we're also seeing that this seems to be a big moment for Mexico, yes. as we're seeing Mexico has become the U.S. largest trading partner at this point of time. How do you think? Do you think this is going to last? Do you, how, what's your take on this? Um, I think uh, Biden actually have different strategy to uh, this different like-minded country of friends. For example, uh, uh, Vietnam is strategically important uh, because it's part of the supply chain uh, in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia. However, Mexico being an FTA partner and also next door, uh, next door neighbor to Biden, and Biden therefore try to put forward all kinds of incentive to attract investment back to Mexico. For example, under the uh, anti-inflation, Act, they, pro uh, they offer all kinds of incentives so that right now we're already seeing part of the, for example, the Tesla supply chain mm -hmm. a bit move, uh, moving towards Mexico. So that's part of Biden's strategy to mm -hmm. uh, enhance Mexico's uh, position. Right. And with Biden and Xi's meeting said, Biden is also looking to improve U.S.-China relations, regardless of things we said earlier, aiming for a diplomatic victory to aid his re-election efforts. Now, conversely, China also anticipates U.S. concessions, such as relaxed semiconductor supply chain restrictions and lower tariffs. However, it is still uncertain whether the talks will lead to any specific or significant breakthroughs. Now, um, Vincent, we talked about the re-election earlier. We're talking about, the, you know, like the domestic problems or challenges that we're seeing in the U.S. right now. Um, so do you think to boost Biden's chances for a re-election, do you think it will be likely for the Biden administration to offer significant compromises on semiconductors or even, you know, the trade tariffs to China? Uh, I'll be honest, no and no. I mean, <laughs> honestly, I, I, I disagree with the premise of how this has been presented. I simply don't see um, any so-called diplomatic breakthrough with China either on the horizon or as beneficial to President Biden's re-election campaign. I think the truth of the matter is across the United States right now, I mean, there is a pretty strong sentiment against the CCP, uh, against what the PRC is doing um, in terms of both the East and South China Seas, in terms of the economic coercive campaign, in terms of disinformation even. And so to, 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 si to say that um, Biden's going to receive some sort of electoral boost because of a good relationship with China, I don't necessarily see that okay. on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I also don't see Biden offering any significant concessions on these issues simply because there is no interest in doing so at this point. I mean, the only interest I would say that had existed uh, probably last year was in terms of reducing inflation. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, for example, Biden could reduce uh, inflation of imported goods, uh, the prices of imported goods and, and therefore inflation, by lowering some tariffs, I think um, that would have been the overriding interest last year. I don't see that necessarily being still the case this year. I think both Biden as well as Blinken and other folks in the U.S. have been quite clear. I think this is about relationship management. It's not about breakthroughs anymore. It's about ensuring clarity of intentions, avoiding misunderstandings and misinterpretations, avoiding accidents, and ensuring that both sides have a clear channel of communication, whether it's between political leaders or on the military side as well. And I think precisely this is what uh, this potential discussion, I mean, the Chinese have not confirmed it, the U.S. has, um, over at APEC will probably entail. So I think we'll probably see some sort of joint engagements on forging new ways of dialogue, new platforms and so forth. But I would hesitate to say 
that this could translate into anything on the economic front. Mm, that's a very good point. What about Xu? Do you agree with what Vincent <laughs> just said? First of all, I also agree with Vincent mm -hmm. that um, even Biden is willing to uh, offer a significant compromise. I don't think uh, it's going to help his election, <laughs> given all the sentiment and also bipartisan consensus in the United States to uh, contain uh, China. Having said that, I think um, I think um, Biden, uh, when uh, he took office, he continued to adopt uh, the 301 uh, tariffs uh, by Trump, and that is to everyone's surprise. And uh, he did once consider removing some of the tariffs on um, uh, consumer goods, such as garments, um, uh, milk powder, and all this non-sensitive um, consumer product. However, he, uh, they have to give up the idea because Pelosi visit Taiwan and then China uh, increases uh, military uh, exercise um, uh, against Taiwan. So I think uh, for uh, for Chinese side, Chinese uh, definitely have a list of um, issues to be talked with by to be talking uh, with Biden. And among this is, of course, a terror is one uh, important uh, mm -hmm. issue because um, as I mentioned that uh, the terror have been there for six years and it's time to review that. And also uh, China from time to time openly criticized the uh, export control uh, on on uh, semiconductor and also the sanctions on Chinese companies such as Huawei and also SMIC. So I think this were definitely on the agenda, on the agenda. And for Biden's side, I think Biden, I agree with Vincent again that um, probably uh, 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 they may discuss to um, review tariffs on some of the non-sensitive uh, products. And also, uh, I think there is also a chance that the two parties may uh, revisit and resume the what we call the uh, uh, first phase uh, trade agreement uh, that was signed uh, by Biden and also Liu He back in early 2020. And uh, if they can bring back that trade agreement, uh, they can sit down and uh, reassume, for example, strategic dialogue on economic issues, and also they can review um, um, tariffs, and also they can encourage or force China to uh, 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 in uh, to procure or import more of Chinese, uh, more of U.S. product. I think that will be uh, very important to uh, the U.S. So if that can be discussed, I think it will create um, a win-win situation. And that may also turn to be a turning point for two parties to consider uh, a resume or even establish a new uh, economic partnership. So the bottom line here is there will be no breakthroughs, but they will probably reopen some dialogues in order to secure stability for both, you know, like superpowers. So Vincent, you're very solid on this. Do you believe uh -oh. that, you know, probably there's not going to be any sort of improvements um, between the U.S. and China before the re-election? I think there could be improvement. I mean, I just don't think there's going to be major economic breakthroughs. And for the same reason that you know, ultimately, I think countries act in their best self-interest. And, and at this point, I just don't see the U.S. self-interest being served uh, by, number one, um, being seen. Mm -hmm. You know, this could be true or not, but being seen or perceived as weak on China or conciliatory China. Or neither is it served by um, relaxing tariffs on a wide range of items, particularly on issues that do have economic considerations and strategic implications for the United States. So that's why I, I feel like I'm more or less certain, uh, as certain as some any prediction could be, it could be absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. um, but I think the key point is this. I, I think the United States is focused on a couple of issues. They're focused, number one, on peace and stability, not only here in the Taiwan Strait, but across the region. So I think that would be probably the foremost yeah. on the agenda, including uh, Taiwan's upcoming election. I do think that the United States uh, will continue to engage with Beijing to try to press them. Um, to respect the status quo as we see today, to refrain from any lateral changes to the status quo as we see Xi Jinping has increasingly been talking about and so forth. So I think that the strategic component here in the region is probably the first issue. The second issue, we don't, I mean, we have to remember Ukraine, I mean, uh, it, Israel and Hamas, I mean, all of these regional flashpoints are issues that China can have a role in mm -hmm. um, and, and is having a role in. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and whether that role is necessarily, you know, in the interest of both China and the United States, I don't think so right now, but I think certainly the U.S. is going to try to press China to do a little bit more on curbing Russia in, in terms of their war there, in terms of delivering humanitarian assistance to the Middle East mm -hmm. and so forth. So I do think that these kind of more regional strategic issues will probably dominate the talks rather than any sort of concrete um, expression of breakthroughs on the bilateral front. 
Mm -hmm. So we're saying that uh, we're coming down to the last bit of the show. I just wanted to point out that, you know, try to warm up for the APEC a little bit that's coming up very soon. And this will probably, she and Biden will also be meeting on the sideline. And w it's been almost probably more than a year that they last met. But after that, um, since they last met in Bali, the tension mm -hmm. actually went worse. Now, this time, last bit, what's something that you think most significantly both leaders will be talking about at APAC when they see each other? And second, do you think it will also provide a positive outcome? We'll start with Vincent first. I think security here in the Taiwan Strait and across the Indo-Pacific region is going to be the number one issue. And I, I, I shy away from saying there is going to be a positive outcome because the two positions are so far apart. But I think the United States, and I hope the United States, will continue to engage with China to make them see how Taiwan mm -hmm. is currently engaged in maintaining stability here, and we hope that China can do so as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I think that there will be a political agenda, including the Taiwan issue and also including the uh, Ukraine and Russian war and also the uh, current uh, situation in uh, Israel. So I think there will be the major focus. However, uh, I think in Biden wants to uh, send some gifts to uh, Xi. I think they may also possibly touch upon some trade issues, some investment issues, especially uh, further collaboration on climate change and also energy right. issues. And uh, if you think um, uh, semiconductor is going to be the strategic uh, issue for them, I think currently uh, Biden will not uh, likely to uh, uh, a take a softened stance on um, semiconductor because it has uh, in the past years already successfully formed and initiate all this international organization mm -hmm. and initiative to work with Japan, Netherlands. I think it will be very, very difficult for Biden to uh, step from that kind of progress. All right. Thank you so much, Shu. And thank you, Vincent, for your great thank insights. You. Now, this is the end of the show. If you like our show, please don't forget to like and also subscribe. Thank you all very much. Stay safe and see you all next time.